Great. Thank you so much. It's such a delight to be here. I was here uh, a little bit for this conference, Wisdom 2.0, so it was, it was kind of nice coming back into the same room and just, just sort of settling. So um, I, as uh, you doubtless know, I'm a meditation teacher. And it's very funny now when I'm introduced that way because I came back from India where I'd first gone to study. Uh, I went in 1970 and, and came back in 1974. And in those days, I'd be at a party or some social situation, and people would say to me, what do you do? And I'd say, I teach meditation. And they would kind of go, oh, that's <laughs> weird. Or occasionally, somebody would say to me, oh, did you meet the Beatles when you were over there? And I'd say, sadly, no. They went when I was in high school. And now, all these years later, after so much more significant research and uh, science and, and kind of a relanguaging of the whole process, the most common response I hear when I say I teach meditation is, I'm so stressed out. I could really use some of that. <laughs> Although my favorite response, which I also hear sometimes, is my partner should really meet you. That would be really good for them. <laughs> and these days, even uh, going beyond the context of stress, people see meditation, I think rightly so, as a kind of capacity building, as a way of finding resourcefulness and uh, kind of an innovative energy within themselves. Sometimes I hear the, the response which concerns me the most, which is, oh, I tried that once, I failed at it. I couldn't do it. And then what follows is some description of what people expect. I should be able to stop all my thinking. I should have a completely blank mind. I should have only beautiful thoughts, like doubtless everyone else in the room is having. I should uh, be able to keep sleepiness completely at bay. I should find perfect peace within the first hour, whatever it might be. And, and that, of course, concerns me, because we say, we believe very strongly, you cannot fail at it. It's impossible. Because the essence of, of the meditative process is changing the way we relate to everything. So it's that quality of relationship. That's where the transformation takes place. So you can't actually be having the wrong experience, the wrong thing happening. So I'd gone to India to begin with. It was actually my junior year in college. Um, I went to college when I was 16. I'm a product of the New York City public school system where they like to skip grades. So I'd skip two grades. And when I was a sophomore in college, I took an Asian philosophy course, which quite honestly, as I look back, was sort of happenstance. I needed a philosophy course. It was a requirement. I looked at the schedule, and it was something like, it's on Tuesday. That would be convenient. So let me take that. And of course, the, the course completely changed my life. So uh, this is what I heard in that context, that there were some very practical, immediate, direct tools that anybody could do if they wanted to. There wasn't like a prerequisite. Um, anybody who wished to could pick them up, and that these tools of meditation were like skills training. Training, first of all, in concentration, in the ability to stabilize our attention. Most of us experience ourselves as fairly distracted, maybe not in every realm of our experience, but at least in some where we sit down to think something through or work through a dilemma, and then we're gone. The way our minds tend to jump to the past, and so we go over and over and over some situation, often one where we now have some kind of tinge of regret. I should have said nothing. I should have said more. <laughs> why did I go there? Why, didn't I, why did I stay? <laughs> you know, whatever it is. And we don't go over it with an eye toward making amends or learning from our mistakes. We just go over it and over it and over it and over it. Or our minds jump to the future and we create a scenario that has not happened and may never happen, which is different than just kind of creating a space and letting your mind roam. It's more like an anxiety-driven construct of like, well, then this is going to happen, then that's going to happen, and no doubt it'll all fall apart when that happens. And, and then we emerge from that with, with kind of the burden of that. So our minds tend to jump to the past, jump to the future, judgment, speculation. And the process of developing concentration is one of more stabilizing our attention. It's not 
in a frozen way. It's not in a rigid way, but it's it's like with tremendous flexibility and fluidity. So we realize we're gone, we can come back. So that the end result is that we're much more centered and grounded and present, and we recapture all that energy, which has been just flying all over the place. The larger consequence, the feeling of, of that sort of distraction is said to be a kind of fragmentation. It's the way we have so much role identification often in the society that people say, I feel like I'm one person at work and I'm a different person at home. Or my very favorite example of that still is I was teaching in New York City somewhere and somebody raised her hand and she said, I feel filled with loving kindness and compassion for all beings everywhere as long as I'm alone. <laughs> but once I'm with others is really rough. And everybody laughed because we all knew exactly what she meant. And it can be the other way around. We might feel fine when we're with others and very ill at ease being alone. So our lives can be very cut apart or seem very cut apart, whereas the reality is that they're seamless. We're of one piece. So concentration and a greater stabilization of attention is one of the great skills of meditation. The second is mindfulness, which for me feels kind of like the word of the hour. When I came back from India, of course, no one ever used the word mindfulness unless you were using it in a very kind of classical context in terms of of meditation training, and now it's just everywhere. One of my, I teach in Washington, D.C. about once a month, and one of my great amusements is listening to the conductors, uh, because every once in a while they will say, please be mindful of the gap between the train and the station platform, and they get very excited. I think, oh, they said mindful. <laughs> Mostly they say what they really mean, which is please be careful of the gap. I recently had a conductor who simply said, there's a gap. It's like, no hint about how he wanted you to relate to it. It's just like, there it is. But really, you hear this word like everywhere now. So classically, mindfulness means a quality of awareness, a way of paying attention so that our perception of what's happening in the moment is not so distorted by bias. Projection into the future, like what's this going to feel like in three months, eight months, 10 years, right? Which distorts our sense of what's happening right now. And interestingly, uh, interestingly enough, as an example of that, in some of the meditation research around physical pain, what they've discovered, and this is Richie Davidson's lab in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, was that, I don't know how they got IRB approval to inflict pain, but somehow they did. <laughs> And what they discovered was that the difference between meditators and non-meditators was not the reaction to the pain. Everybody had the reaction to the pain. But the difference was in terms of what happened next, where they said non-meditators ten tended to flip into an anticipatory cycle. It's like whatever happened in terms of the pain, uh, you know, the tension, the reaction, happened, but then they didn't relax subsequent to that because they were very caught up in when's the next bout coming? How bad is it going to be? How intense will it be? Right? Whereas the meditators had that same reaction to pain, but then it was over. And they weren't caught in all of that anticipation. It's interesting. So maybe that is, is a great tendency. Or we just pile on to our experience in some way. Uh, we're continually adding so many layers of interpretation and judgment that we lose touch with what is actually happening right now. Or we have a big thing about control. I shouldn't be feeling this. Why is this here? I've been meditating for 40 years. It shouldn't be here anymore. Spent $10,000 in therapy just last year. Surely it should be gone. Or no one else feels this. Or whatever it might be all of which tends to distort the actual experience. And so uh, we say that mindfulness is the ability to make the distinction between what our direct experience is and then everything we make of it. And it's not to say we, we want to destroy or annihilate that narrative capacity. We want that, for sure. But we don't necessarily want to be stuck there, right? We might want more to be able to see things from different angles and see them for ourselves, just in the, in the interests of freedom. 
So my favorite example of mindfulness these days is let's say you're on your way to a party and you run into a friend and the friend says to you, you know who I met today? That new person who's going to be our colleague and they're really, really, really boring. And then you go to the party and who do you end up stuck talking to but the very person you have just been told is like the most boring person on earth? Very likely, you don't really listen to them. You don't really look at them. You're thinking about the 50 emails you need to send or everybody else you'd rather be talking to than this very person. But sometimes we realize that and we stop and we gather our attention and we do really listen and we really look. Maybe we come to the end of that party and we walk out thinking, you know, that new person they are so boring. But maybe we don't, because life is full of surprises when we pay attention. So why take a borrowed impression, what someone else said about something or someone, rather than developing our capacity to realize that, let go of some of those preconceptions and assumptions, see more directly, and decide for ourselves. So one of the great dangers of mindfulness in terms of the language that we tend to use around it is that it can seem so passive, it's so complacent. Or so it seems, of course it isn't really. When we say things like mindfulness means accepting things the way that they are, it sounds like you're gonna vegetate. Um, or be with your experience without judgment that you're gonna lose discernment and, and an edge of, of activity, and of course it's not like that at all. It's, it's much more creating that space that our action is comprehensive, it's not coming from someone else's vision of what's true, that we can, we can make choice very easily. Um, we're going to do just a little bit of meditation here together, and one of the, the standard uh, kind of beginnings to a meditation instruction is to sit and just listen to sound. Of course, there's not a lot of sound here, but I'll make some just by talking. And I once gave that instruction somewhere and immediately someone raised their hand and said well what if it's the sound of the smoke alarm I hear am I supposed to sit here mindfully knowing that the smoke alarm is going off or should I get up and I said I'd get up <laughs> right but I can see how one can have that impression and yet really the the relationship of mindfulness to whatever we're experiencing something very vital and alive and creative because we're freeing ourselves from all of those old habits of perception. And then the last great skill of meditation practice, the third, is compassion or loving kindness. It's compassion for ourselves, compassion for others. And this is a very interesting thing. First of all, the notion that compassion can be trained um, is a little weird, I find, in the West. People think of it as cold and mechanistic, whereas in Eastern psychology, say in Buddhist psychology, absolutely it's considered that compassion can be trained because we know that attention can be trained. And compassion is like an emergent property of how we pay attention. How do we recover when we've made a mistake, when we've lost sight of our aspiration, when we've strayed from our chosen course? And the the kind of mini version of that is inherent in the meditation instruction. You sit down, you have an object of awareness, say it's the feeling of the breath, which is what we're going to do. And most people discover it's not 900 breaths before their attention wanders. Usually it's more like three, or maybe five, or maybe eight, maybe one, and then we're gone. And sometimes we are way gone. And then comes this magic moment when we realize, oh, it's been quite some time since I last felt a breath. That's the moment where instead of berating ourselves and chastising ourselves and feeling like a failure, we practice letting go, we practice <laughs> beginning again. And the only way we can do that is to deepen compassion for ourselves. And this is very interesting. Also, because I was teaching somewhere very recently and someone raised their hand and said, I don't buy that. You know, I think if you have compassion for yourself, in effect, if you forgive yourself, that it just makes you lazy. 
that you're going to give up a sense of clarity about ambition or, or goal and that you're just going to let yourself do anything. And, uh, but I don't honestly buy that because I think if we look at how we learn, how we grow, how we change, it's usually not from that kind of brutal self-judgment. So just in the, in the example of the meditation, you sit down to feel the breath. It is one breath, and then you're gone. It's not that useful. It's not that efficient. It's not that effective to realize that you've been distracted and then launch into this spiral of self-judgment. Can't believe I'm thinking. No one else in the room is thinking. They're all sitting here in bliss. They're all sitting here bathed in brilliant white light. Or is that golden light? I forget what color light that's supposed to be. Some kind of light everybody gets, but I don't have it. They have it. I don't have it. They're not thinking. I'm thinking. Or maybe they are thinking, but they're thinking beautiful thoughts. They're thinking wonderful thoughts. That's because they're wonderful people. I'm not a wonderful person. That's why I'm thinking such stupid thoughts. I'm thinking such petty thoughts. I'm thinking about the traffic flow on Ninth Avenue. Why am I thinking about the traffic flow on Ninth Avenue? I'm not responsible for the traffic flow. And anyway, I wrote to the mayor's office last year, you know, and it's just like, why am I doing that? I'm so bad. I'm so useless, right? So if we just f engage in that, if we fall into that, then not only have we extended the period of distraction sometimes considerably, but it's so demoralizing. It's so exhausting. We say, in contrast, that the healing is in the return, not in never having wandered to begin with. It's in our ability to bounce back, to come back with compassion, with clarity. OK, so that's the, the basic platform of the meditative process. And um, everything I talk about in this book that follows that, resiliency, open awareness, integrity, we consider an emergent property of those three, concentration, mindfulness, and compassion. That's how they get developed in a real way. So that the platform is really uh, using these tools as a kind of skills training, just like I learned way back when. It doesn't have to be involved, needless to say, in a belief system or a dogma or a, a certain kind of tradition even, uh, but just a kind of practical application of these tools. I consider that a very interesting moment too because there is a big difference between thinking about them and doing them. It's, of course, so much easier to think about them than to actually do them. There's something, it's almost like alchemy in that moment where we're not deferring and we're not postponing and we're saying, let me see if this is true for me. It's like a grand experiment that we make. One of the ways this particular book came about for me was um, born from my previous book, a previous book of mine, which is called Real Happiness, which is like a template for establishing a meditation program in one's life. And uh, that book came out a couple of years ago, and subsequent to that, in February, uh, we ran a challenge on my website where people could sign up, and we asked them to blog or comment and describe their own meditation practice. And we asked everyone, please be honest. You know, unless you actually sat down and 10 seconds later you were floating away in a cloud of bliss, don't say that. You know, let's really create an authentic community by disclosing what our experience actually is. So people did that, and it was so beautiful and uh, so interesting. And at the same time, it seemed clear that even given the wide variety of occupations that people were engaged in, from firefighters and undercover policewomen and lots of tech people and school teachers and nurses and all kinds of people, one of the most challenging arenas to take these values and make them real was work. Uh, so then I began to look at, OK, let's say that you understand and practice some amount of stabilizing attention and refining attention through mindfulness and knowing how to begin again and having that, that deepening of compassion. What does that look like? 
in the workplace? What might it look like? And how might you, you take that and, and make it real? You know, so it's not just a nice thought. They say that the greatest predictor of happiness at work is a sense of meaning. And that's very interesting because sometimes the meaning comes not at all from the job description, but it can come from what we bring to that job how we are. First of all, there's a sense of doing a craft well, having great integrity and fullness in doing just the best we can do at something. And it also comes from any kind of communication and connection. Realizing that when we relate to somebody else, whether it's a colleague or a client or whatever it is, that that is a meaningful moment. It's, it's not just nothing. It's not negligible. And that we can, we can use that encounter, whatever it is, toward the, the well-being of not only a mission, but that other person. And I find that with any kind of job. It's, it's really interesting. And I'll just close before we um, start sitting for a few minutes uh, and then do questions with what is, uh, I think, my favorite story from the book. And that is this time, I love telling the story in, in New York City because you don't need a huge long preamble about taxis and changes of shift. But anyway, uh, it was one of those hours when it's so, so hard to get a taxi. Um, and I was, I was further downtown and I was on my way to Midtown, New York to try to hear the Vietnamese Zen teacher Thich Nhat Hanh give a lecture. And it was just that time and you know, I couldn't get a cab, and then a cab finally stopped. And of course, the lights were off, and they asked where you're going so that they could see if your destination matches where they need to drop off the cab. And so I told him, and he said, OK, get in. So I got in the cab, and then we got stuck in the most unbelievable, awful, unthinkable, unbearable traffic. I had never seen anything like it. And we were just crawling along, going nowhere. And my first thought was, oh, great, not going to make the lecture. And then I really felt very bad in terms of the cab driver. I thought he was nice enough to stop. His shift was over. I don't know if he gets penalized in some way. I don't know if he has to pay a fine in some way. And I said to him, I am so sorry. It was really good of you to stop. And now I've never seen traffic like this. It's just unbelievable. I am so, so sorry. And he said to me, Madam, traffic is not your fault. <laughs> and then he said, nor is it mine. <laughs> and I thought, wow. First of all, I don't have to get to the lecture because I just had an enlightened cab driver. And <laughs> that was like my nugget of wisdom for the day. And I kept thinking about that second comment, nor is it mine. And I thought about how many times in a day he's usually blamed for something that's not his fault. Bridge is closed, traffic's crazy, some other driver does something else. And, and I thought, well, wisdom, not to take that on. And I thought, OK, there it is. You know, There's an encounter that was really, really important. So I think that's a, a wonderful example of what we bring to any job that we do and how, how it can really make a difference. OK, so let's do some meditations, OK? <coughs> so we say the essence of meditation practice is balance. That's interesting. Instead of our normal, maybe more acquisitive frame of mind, like if I have a big insight soon, I can get up and leave. The whole sensibility is that the insight, everything else we want, will emerge from bringing our system into greater balance. So they say some balance is experienced right away in our posture. See if your back can be straight without being strained or overarched. You want some energy, but not so much energy that you're really rigid and uptight. You also want to be relaxed, but not like so relaxed that your waist slumped over nearly bound to fall asleep. And we'll start just by listening to sound, whether it's the sound of my voice or other sounds. 
It's a way of relaxing deep inside, allowing our experience to come and go. Of course, we like certain sounds and we don't like others. But we don't have to chase after them to hold on or push away. Just let it come, let it go. And bring your attention to the feeling of your body sitting, whatever sensations you discover. Bring your attention to your hands. See if you can make the shift from the more conceptual level, like go fingers, to the world of direct sensation. Picking up pulsing, throbbing, pressure, whatever it might be. You don't have to name these things, but feel them. And then bring your attention to the feeling of your breath, just the normal, natural breath, wherever it's clearest or strongest for you. Maybe that's the nostrils or the chest or the abdomen. If you find that place, you can bring your attention there and just rest. See if you can feel one breath. And if you like, you can use a quiet mental notation of in, out, or rising, falling, to help support the awareness of the breath, but very quiet, so that your attention your attention's really going to feeling the breath. If images or sounds or sensations or emotions should arise, but they're not all that strong, if you can stay connected to the feeling of the breath, just let them flow on by. You're breathing. But if something comes up with a bang and it just pulls you away, you get lost in thought, spun out in a fantasy, or you fall asleep, don't worry about it. The most important moment of the whole process is considered to be that moment. That's the moment we have the chance to be really different. So instead of judging yourself and condemning yourself, see if you can gently let go and shepherd your attention back to the feeling of the breath.
If you have to let go and begin again like 10,000 times in the next few minutes, that's really okay. That's the training. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes. So we have a little time for questions or comments, anything you'd like to talk about. And um, those two mics are there. If you can make your way over there, that would be great. Hi. Hi. Um, I have been meditating for a couple of years now. Actually, thanks to you, I took some of your classes at the Tibet House. Uh -huh. Um, and I find that I'm still struggling with um, this very basic thing, which is how to focus on the breath without controlling the breath. Mm -hmm. And I've tried all kinds of tricks, and some of them occasionally work. Most of them don't. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Um, what are your tricks? <laughs> um, one of them was to focus, instead of focusing on the most... Um, prominent place where the breath is to focus on something else that's affected by the breath, mm -hmm, such mm -hmm. as like my shoulders and how they're mm -hmm. affected by the breath, mm -hmm. and then I don't control it quite as much. Right. Okay. Um, first of all, I wouldn't worry so much about controlling the breath. You know, it doesn't need to become the major project of your practice. The reason we say uh, don't is more to counter um, the tendency we would have to feel, well, I'm not breathing deeply enough, properly, appropriately, skillfully, whatever it is, and thereby making it a breath exercise rather than an awareness exercise. So if you find that you're controlling the breath somewhat and it's not exhausting you, it's okay. Don't worry about it. A lot of what we talk about um, in terms of uh, controlling the breath is creating a kind of balance so that 
would mean spaciousness, openness, so that the breath is feels like it's happening in a bigger space. And so people, it is like a personal experiment that people make just to see what helps create more of that sense of space. For some people, it's as simple as listening to sound, you know, which tends to be more expansive in awareness or feeling your whole body and feeling the breath happening within the body. Um, it may be that if you're mostly with the breath at the nostrils, that switching to the abdomen uh, will, will have a different sense to it. Um, so it's things like that. It's just kind of playing, mm -hmm. you know, not with a sense of like, I've got to correct this, okay. but just, just to see if you can create some, some balance. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Sharon. Thank you. Hi. Um, or <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've been meditating for quite some time, and uh, the example you brought up about um, sending the letter to the mayor and those demoralizing thoughts, one thing that I've practiced is making them positive. My fear is that it kind of gives you this sense of um, maybe false value or arrogance. Uh, have you seen that happen to people in the past? You know, so you, you have those kind of thoughts and then you you switch them. It's to very be, positive, right? Like, wow, I sent a letter to the mayor. Like, I have all this power, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's a problem. Um, I think ultimately all those different methods and things we try and the tricks and the, and the ways we play are all aimed toward creating a more balanced relationship to our experience. And if that's what helps you see the thought as just a thought and not take it so to heart and not, not be so embroiled in it, it's great. Um, the, the way I usually work is more like myself in my own practices. Um, you know, sometimes I tell this story about once, seeing ha once having seen a cartoon from the Peanuts comic strip. Um, I saw it in a house that some friends had rented for several of us to do a retreat in and it was left on the desk in the bedroom that had been set aside for me so uh, in the first frame of the cartoon Lucy is talking to Charlie Brown and she says oh you know Charlie Brown what your problem is the problem with you is that you're you <laughs> and then in the second frame poor Charlie Brown looks at her and says well what in the world can I do about that then in the third and final frame, Lucy says, I don't pretend to be able to give advice. I merely point out the problem. <laughs> and somehow, whenever I was walking by that desk, my eye would fall right on that line. The problem with you is that you're you. Because that Lucy voice had been so amazingly predominant in my earlier life. And I felt that um, one of the techniques that I have been trained in in terms of mindfulness is called mental noting where you quietly place a label if the word comes easily on your predominant experience. So I felt like seeing that cartoon gave me a new mental note, which was kind of like, hi, Lucy. <laughs> or my favorite form of that was, chill out, Lucy. You know, something great would happen for me, and my next thought would be, it's never going to happen again. And I could say, chill out, Lucy. You know, so it's not like all freaked out, like Lucy's still here after all these years of meditating, or yes, Lucy, you're right, you're always right. But it's, it's a very different kind of relationship of recognition, balance, a little bit of space, a little bit of humor, some tenderness, some, some compassion, and an ability to let go. Like, OK, I see you. So that's one way of working. And if it works for you to work with kind of molding the thoughts or uh, seeing them in a different way, then that's, you know, that's just another way of bringing balance. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, I just had a question. Um, I've kind of been a meditation dabbler for a number of years, uh, but I've never, never had a long-term teacher. But I did have long-term music teachers. And I just wonder um, if kind of the, this the instruction you gave is similar to instruction I've heard elsewhere. And I, and I guess I just wonder if you've been doing it for a long time or whatever your experience was, um, if kind of by analogy, what we do now is sort of like playing scales and then when you're at your level, it's like you're playing Brahms concertos or something. Um, if, if it's like a really fundamentally, amazingly different experience or 
it, if you could somehow speak to yeah. uh -huh. what the process is like. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I actually see the instruction as a fractal, which fascinates me. Like the very first instruction I ever got when I went to India all those years ago and, and uh, began my meditation practice, which was in the context of an intensive 10-day retreat, because it took me a while to find just the kind of practical, pragmatic approach I was looking for. That was the first instruction I heard, sit down and feel your breath. And, and I was very dismissive. I thought, feel my breath. I came all the way to India. You know, where's the magnificent, fantastic, esoteric technique that's going to wipe out all my suffering and make me a totally happy person? I thought, feel my breath. I could have stayed in Buffalo where I was going to school <laughs> to feel my breath. And then I thought, huh, how hard can this be? And then it was like, whoa, this is not so easy. You know, so there's so much contained in that simple instruction. Settle your mind in the moment. Realize you're distracted and come back. There's, there's a huge amount there that has ramifications and, and implications for something so much bigger. So um, in a way, I'm still playing the scales, you know, 40 years later. Uh, and another way, of course, my experience is completely different. I think I was, um, I was so self-judgmental in the kind of level of anguish that I experienced and expressed when I was uh, distracted or had an emotion I didn't like. And, um, was very strong. And now it's much more like, hey, chill out, Lucy, uh, which makes a big difference. I was, um, I think there's a, a common trajectory that people go through depending on what motivates you. In the beginning, uh, there's like a trajectory toward greater and greater um, inclusivity and compassion uh, that's born out of wisdom. Like, uh, you know, it's not, it's not uh, forced. It's it's not something that uh, you feel obliged to to develop. It's just something shifts so that um, even if you're thinking about your job, there's just a, a kind of recognition of how many other people need to do their jobs in a good way so that you can do your job in a good way, right? That we're not so isolated, we're not so alone, that we exist as part of networks and patterns and uh, a, a bigger fabric of life. Or my very favorite reflection, which we could do right now, is how many people come to mind as having played any kind of role in your being here in this room right now. Right? Because we're all here, because myself included, because of conversations and encounters and relationships and somebody gave us a book or someone told us about their meditation practice or whatever it might be. It's just layers and layers and layers. So this moment in time is actually a confluence of connections, as is every moment in time. And so whereas, you know, in the beginning that might have seemed like an abstract notion to me <clears throat> because I saw it and saw it and saw it to be true, then it's just, it's just different in those ways. And so one of the things I really love about meditation practice um, is, is the level in which it seems to change us. Because it's not deliberative and it's not studied in the sense that um, you're not encountering a stranger and feeling disinterested and then thinking, well, you know, I just did an eight-week meditation class on compassion, and I really should force myself to smile and, you know, pretend to be interested. It's not like that. You know, there's, there's just shifts that go on so that these things come much more naturally. I remember when uh, the Dalai Lama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, one of my friends said, giving the Dalai Lama a peace prize is like giving Mother Nature an art award, <laughs> you know, but his level of compassion, I thought of him because I've seen him meet many strangers, obviously, you know, and of all kinds, and he always seems to be present and interested and caring. You don't get the feeling he's sitting there thinking, oh, God, you know, not you, uh, not five more people. I can't believe it, but I am the Dalai Lama, so I better act like, you know, I care. There seems to be a, a very authentic sense of presence. And, but he's the one that gets up at like three every morning and practices for three hours. It didn't just happen, but the changes 
become embodied. They become, they become more natural in that way. Hi. Hi. Um, so when I think about mindfulness and kind of everyday life, not specifically just during meditation, um, and I think about the distractions that all of us have in life here, it's usually a vibrating phone or an email alert or something. Um, but then also with all of the other people that you met in various professions, I'm wondering if there were, you know, any more practical tips mm -hmm. or just general things that worked for people, mm -hmm. um, whether it was ignoring those distractions or making a note of them and um, mm -hmm. what works. Mm -hmm. Great. So what, what tends to work is ritualizing kinds of pauses. You know, they don't, well, two things. One is unitasking every now and then instead of multitasking. And the other is ritualizing certain pauses. They don't have to be, um, neither has to be very uh, lengthy, but we need them to punctuate our day so that they're repeated. Um, and in terms of uh, <clears throat> pauses, for example, a very uh, kind of classic example would be don't pick up the phone on the first ring let it ring three times and breathe, and then you pick it up. It's almost unbearable to think about, but if you actually do it, um, it it's like in those moments we can return to ourselves, because usually what happens is, you know, as you are implying, is that we get caught in this kind of crazy momentum, and we're taken so far away from ourselves that we're just, and we're getting increasingly agitated, then it's harder to return, because we know it's gonna feel uncomfortable. <laughs> when we come back, but if we just kind of regularly come back, we come back to the moment, we come back to ourselves, we can utilize something like the breath, which is with us. I was gonna say always, except I learned uh, in doing an interview for this book, the, the journalist told me there was such a thing as email apnea, which I hadn't known before, <laughs> that people tend to stop breathing, actually checking email. Um, uh, which is also interesting, you know, and kind of dreadful. Uh, but uh, since we're breathing most of the time, and we could be breathing more if, we, if we're if we mindful, it's a great vehicle for just coming back. And once we come back to the moment and to ourselves, we're also coming back to our sense of priorities, our sense of values. They're just apparent to us, whereas they're not when we're just kind of caught in the momentum. And then unitasking. Um, I'm sure you know studies show that multitasking isn't as great as we, it's made out to be and that we're actually not more effective, we're not more efficient, we're not getting more done. So even though you know, we've got this huge amount to do and it seems like it will get done the best if we do it all at once, it's not gonna happen in a, in a good way. And so here too, it's like a question of ritualizing or committing, like three times a day, if I'm drinking a cup of tea or drinking a cup of coffee, I'm gonna just do that. I'm not gonna do that and check my email and have a phone conversation and watch the news on TV, and, you know. Um, and if we, if we can get into that habit of just bringing mindfulness uh, in these short moments, one of my teachers said short moments many times, uh, then it will make a very big difference. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question is on oneness, which you touched on a little bit earlier, but I was hoping we could dive into more detail. So in New York City and at work, we can often get caught up in I, I'm late for work, I need a taxi, I want that promotion, I'd like to be the one to improve that algorithm, product, etc. cetera. Um, Google is great at fostering a we-driven environment. But how can we, on a personal level, use our practice to connect with that idea of oneness and become closer to it and really indoctrinate it into our daily work? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reflections that, that we do, I mean, I think one answer is actually a kind of loving kindness meditation or, or training so that we really look at others rather than look through them. And that, um, we, you know, if you think about the people you might normally encounter who are kind of neutral for you, like checkout person in a supermarket or, or whatever it might be, 
uh, where we do tend to create an other out of indifference, not antipathy or prejudice, but just indifference. And you make the experiment. What happens when I actually look at somebody instead of look through them? And in terms of work as well, there's, there's a certain um, remembrance that, first of all, everybody's a human being and everybody wants to be happy. It doesn't mean you're not competing sometimes or, or whatever it might be, but um, there's a certain remembrance, and you actually can do it as a kind of reflection. Everybody's a human being and everybody wants to be happy. And sometimes a corollary to that is everybody makes mistakes. So after I'd written the book, in addition to now I'm in that phase where uh, it's after the book, so now I'm learning all these other things, <laughs> and all these people are bringing anecdotes and stuff, and I think, oh, damn. <laughs> you know. But anyway, um, after I'd written the book, I was teaching somewhere here in New York, and somebody came to me and said, um, all week long my boss has been like a tyrant in a very uncharacteristic way, and she's been really unfair, and she's been really off-putting and, and critical, and it was only sitting here meditating that it occurred to me for the first time, maybe she's going through something. Maybe something hard is happening in her life. And, and I said to her, well, do you have the kind of relationship where you can ask her, is anything going on? She said, you know, actually I do. But I thought that was an interesting moment. It's like we, um, we don't usually stop and think, oh, maybe that person has something going on right, because we're just engaged in defensive or, or reactive mode. And uh, I think it's just a very powerful reflection. Everybody's a human being, and everybody wants to be happy. And of course, the fear is that that's going to make us sort of weak and sentimental and kind of gooey, and we're going to lose our edge. And uh, But I think the reality, of course, is not that at all. It's just, it's, it is more, as you say, a kind of we consciousness within which we can be quite strong. So... I think we need to stop, but maybe one more. Just finish. Hey, uh, thanks, sir. Thanks for being here. Um, sure. so I have a question about loving kindness meditation. Uh, I've sort of practiced mindfulness meditation on and off for a couple of years, um, but every time I've tried to get into loving kindness, it's it ends up being much easier to direct sort of positive thoughts externally than than internally. And I guess that's the order: you start with yourself, and then the mm -hmm. ones close to you, and then sort of neutral. Um, Understanding that probably comes from some sort of self-judgment place. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. is there a set of tricks or something, like something mm -hmm. that makes that barrier easier to cross? Uh -huh. I'll teach you the basic trick. Don't start with yourself. No, truly. The, the principle of loving kindness practice, where instead of gathering our attention around the feeling of the breath, we're gathering our attention around the silent repetition of certain phrases. Um, very simple phrases like, may I be happy or may you be happy, something like that. Um, and the, the principle, classically, is that it's supposed to be done in the easiest way possible. And the reality is that starting with ourselves, which is how you're supposed to start, because it's said to be easiest, is not always easiest. Sometimes it's really, really hard. Uh, so I always go back to that fundamental principle of doing it in the easiest way possible. Because part of what's developing um, along with the loving kindness is confidence and clarity. It's understanding the difference between maybe having compassion for someone else and giving in, or understanding what it feels like to have compassion for yourself and someone else. Or, you know, th there's a lot that is developing all along the way, and so um, it's, it's worth not struggling. It doesn't mean you never include yourself, because you have to, but doesn't have to be right away, it really doesn't. Okay, thank you.